let me just take a brief moment to outline the goals for our discussion today and at least share a little bit about why we at PACE wanted to be part of helping convene this discussion. PACE is a network of foundations and funders that invest in civic engagement and democratic practice. We are a pretty diverse network of small foundations, large foundations and funders all across the country who take a really diverse approach to the issues that we work on. But really the shared belief of all of the members in our network is that America will be more healthy, resilient, and productive if democracy is strong and the office of citizen is treated as central to how it functions. Obviously, it's an important time for democracy right now. It's, it's always an important time, but in particular, the recent presidential election has led many people in our community to call for a renewed focus on civic learning. And so at PACE, we're getting a lot of questions from funders about what's happening in the field of civic learning and how they might think about getting involved. And so we wanted to provide an outlet for that discussion to just understand a little bit more about how some foundations and funders are engaging in this space and what some of the opportunities to do that might be for folks who want to think about engaging more deliberately or more intentionally in this work. So I want to start by, in, in providing that context for the discussion, acknowledging that the field of civic learning is a very diverse field. And it includes those who work on both the policy and the systems level, as well as the school-based and program and community level um, in terms of program and service delivery. So today Today is just a very preliminary snapshot of this field. Um, there are lots of folks doing interesting work, and we wanted to provide just a little bit of a, of a window into that. PACE as a network does not advocate for specific programs or approaches, but we do like to provide spaces for some of our members to discuss how they engage so that others might have their thinking sparked about how they might consider investing in similar types of, of this work. And so with that kind of framing for what we hope to accomplish today, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sense of how we anticipate this call running. We're going to start by giving a little bit of a landscape assessment of the field um, of civic learning. Again, just a, a very brief snapshot into the diverse and expansive work that is happening in this field. And also talk about why we think that this is really important um, field to be elevating and discussing at this time. So we're going to spend about 15 minutes on that landscape analysis. And then we're going to talk and hear from some people who are working really um, intentionally and deliberately in the field to highlight some of the ideas and ways that they approach this work. So we're going to lift up three different approaches to this work um, and highlight some of those ideas. And then we're going to have the opportunity for Q&A to hear from all of you all about what questions you might have in thinking about how your philanthropic activity can engage more in the field of civic learning. So we're going to have that for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, we'll see how the call goes. We're planning on, all the speakers are planning on being able to stay on until about 4.15 Eastern, 12.15 Pacific. So if you need to jump off in the Q&A before that, if you need to get off at 4, that's fine. But we will try to stay on as long as you guys have questions leading up to about 4.15. So if that sounds good, I want to um, go ahead and kick us off and I want to acknowledge and appreciate a couple PACE members who are joining us on today's call and are really doing a lot of work in the field of civic learning and civic education. And so I want to just acknowledge um, the PACE members, the McCormick Foundation and the Foundation from Civic Leadership who you will hear from on today's call. And I also want to thank our friends at MICFA and CERC and Generation Citizen, the Funders Collaborative for Youth Organizing, um, for inviting PACE to be part of generating what I hope will be a robust discussion for us to engage in today.
So thank you all. Thank you guys for being here. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to Kay Kawashima Ginsberg, who is the director of the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, to talk to us about why this moment in time is important for civic learning. Kay? Thank you, Kristen, and thank you so much, everyone, for getting together this afternoon. It's such an honor to be here. And I would like to spend a few minutes really coming from the researcher's perspective here at Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University in Circle to give you an overview of what we're seeing as why there's such a need today and especially now by looking at some of the gaps we see in civic engagement among young people, as well as some of the emerging areas of high need that seems to be really coming out because of the election and particular shifts in the political context. Next slide, please. So I'll start by talking about the state of youth civic participation using just voter participation as one indicator. And I can confidently say this trend tends to really overlap with other kinds of civic engagement, such as volunteering, youth activism, online participation even. But this is one measure that we have going back to 1970s. So what I'm showing you is a participation gap by education or attainment. Since 1972, when the census started collecting voter participation data, there's always been an enormous gap between young people who have college education and those who do not. And despite all these efforts that's been happening in the last 15 to 16 years in really promoting youth civic participation, the gap actually hasn't decreased at all. And when we can look at the next slide, you can see also, next slide please, even when students or young people make it into college where there are a lot of opportunities for learning about politics, participating in democratic engagement, and learning in the community through experiential service learning and internships, there's still an enormous gap between young people coming from different racial backgrounds, even just in voter turnout. And this gap also is true for choice of majors, gender in some cases, and you know whether young people are coming from lower socioeconomic status or not. This data comes from the ENSOL, which is also at Tufts University's um, Tisch College, from the IDHE. This is based on the 2012 voter turnout. Now, in the next slide, I actually want to show you even more serious and concerning gap, which we don't talk about as much, which is the midterm civic engagement gap. So again, this is a voter turnout going back to 1974 among 18 to 29 year olds. You'll see the similar gap that's enormous you know in some cases it's four times as much for college educated young people as opposed to less than high school and the simple turnout in the ninth uh, the last midterm election we had was 20 percent much less than half of the presidential turnout that we see. So there's this enormous drop off between presidential and midterm and that drop off is bigger for the young people for a variety of reason. And also you'll see in terms of the trend line, even for the college educated youth, the turnout in midterm was almost 50% in 1970s. Now we're down to 32%. So unlike the presidential participation where there's been pretty much a flat line somewhere around 45 50 percent participation among young people there's been a significant decline in midterm participation all these really reflect what young people have been saying in surveys and in person which is that they're just less interested in politics they feel that that leaves them bad taste in their mouths they're unexcited by what's happening in Washington DC and they don't really always feel like they have a voice in our democracy so what should we do about that? And why are these things happening? Some of the things that I'm gonna point out in the next slides are really the emerging trends that I'm seeing. And one of the reasons why we really need stronger civic education and for all. And I apologize in advance for the bad visual here. There's some problem with font size. So I'm gonna to try to read it to you. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is really what we're hearing in media a lot, which is around the fake news and whether young people can really discern facts from fiction. How do we teach young people about the news literacy so that they're starting to really understand what's happening in our news and then start to really grow an appetite to participate in our politics. The visual that I'm showing is really from the study that was published by Joe Kahn and uh, Bowyer that came out this last year, really recently, on the study of news literacy. 
the study focused on the context, which is that, you know, the news environment that we have based on the technology has shifted significantly. We now have enormous influence of social media. Cable news has become really prominent. That leads to each of us being able to really curate our news environment to the point where we're really hearing things that we want to hear and confirming with news and information what we already believe. The researchers call that motivated reasoning, which really clouds our judgment and ability to both seek and assess news and information with a neutral and objective lens. What they're finding in this research study was that the, when we have knowledge about political um, systems and laws, that doesn't necessarily uh, minimize the uh, the effect of motivated reasoning in that the young people who had political knowledge were just as likely to misjudge the news source when they had motivated reasoning. However, when young people received media literacy education, the young people were more likely to at least take a step back and refrain from making a quick judgment about the news sources. When we don't have these interventions, though, what happens when there's motivated reasoning for all of us and we have diminished ability to seek and assess new sources, that leads to even more political polarization, which we know has affected us in so many ways. But for young people, the one side effect of political polarization is that, again, they feel that the politics is really just uncomfortable, challenging, and not worth getting into. And that's been a big agenda, and as a field, we really need to address news literacy. Since there seems to be a promise, once we actually do a good job in intervening with these skills, young people can gain the skills and they can become more informed news consumer who would also be willing to engage in political discussion. Next slide, please. So another thing that we're seeing, and actually related to the political polarization slide that I just showed you, is the fact that young people, even though they are the most diverse generation to date in American history, still experience and show an incredible amount of polarization, even amongst this generation. This is a graph that shows the amount of trust that young people showed in our pre-election millennial poll. It was a large representative sample study where we asked questions about what they trust as well as the political engagement questions. What we're seeing is that you know, some institutions have uniformly low trust, which is really the trend that we have seen in general national surveys like the large corporation and Congress. But with some key institutions, such as religious institution, military, and police, which actually isn't in here, there is an enormous disparity. For example, with police, 63% of millennials trusted police as opposed to 23%. And here, religious institution, we're seeing pretty good amount of differences here. So what we're seeing is that depending on what their background is, young people are starting to not have an ability to see the commonality where they can work together and whom they trust. And that obviously has enormous implications on the health of our democracy. Next slide, please. So how do we teach young people to learn to work across differences, knowing that there are already differences coming from political polarization, news environment, and this divide that they've already shown? Um, also, one thing to note is that in the community, we have really been losing a lot of natural places for the bridging capital to be built. Some of it is religious organizations, uh, workplace unions, and even community organizations are starting to sh lose attraction from young people. And again, that's starting to really mean that young people really need an intentional ways in which they learn these skills. And civic education really is one of those key places where young people can both learn the skills, but also build the willingness and attitude and experience in engaging in democracy. And many of these programs and policy solutions that many of my colleagues here will present later today will start to give you the understanding of the potential and impact of that. I think I want to go to the last slide now, just one last thing here. And one last thing I want to note, and you'll hear this today because of the diversity of our field in civic learning, is that there are many levers for civic learning 
we tend to talk a lot about civic education here at Circle, but you know, it's really important to recognize that the opportunities for civic development are embedded in multiple layers of youth development, starting from family at the dinner table, in schools, in community centers, in workplaces, and cultural institutions. And as a field, we need to really start to look at how these, these settings match together. How can we match different solutions together for maximum impact and leverage? So I'll finish here and thank you for your attention. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to now introduce you all to Scott Warren, uh, Executive Director of Generation Citizen. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks so much, Kay. Um, uh, always so terrific to have Kay and Circle of Expertise in this work. Um, I'm Scott Warren, uh, co-founder of, of Generation Citizen. Uh, so delighted that all of you could, could join uh, here today and gonna spend a little bit more time talking about the, the framework of why we're doing this webinar now, some of the, the, the different aspects going on in the field, and we're gonna actually get into the nitty-gritty of the type of work going on. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So why why now? And, and I think this has been interesting because, so you know, we had over 100 folks sign up for this webinar specifically geared towards funders to talk about civic education. Uh, you know, we have we have 70 on the on the call right now. If we had this webinar a year ago, I doubt we could have gotten um, more than than 20. And and Kristen sort of talked about this at the beginning. And and I think this election uh, has made people more interested in this space. I want to make clear that this isn't about um, the result of, of of the election, which which is obviously unprecedented, but how the entire process played out. And and I think you know after a, a pretty substance free election. Um, Kay went over over some of the turnout. Um, you're seeing people more, more interested in this space uh, than than we've ever seen before, which is which is which is good for us as a space. Um, I think there's there's a number of questions that that we now have to grapple with. One is is how do we sustain this attention beyond just right after the election? So um, you know if people are are excited about talking about the importance of youth political engagement right after the election, that's great. Um, but um, but 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 you know it's and and I have this as a, a later point. Change is not going to happen overnight, and I think this is one of the, the challenges with the field, especially as it pertains um, to to philanthropy, uh, is that a lot of times people want to see you know immediate results. Um, you could give all the the groups that will present on this call millions and millions of dollars, and you're not going to see um, you know different results right away in, in elections to come. But you might see a democ a different democracy in in 20 to to 30 years. Um, and so I think that's an important point that, that, that we have to, to try to figure out how to have a real conversation about. Um, we want to talk, you know, as, as both Kristen and Kate talked about, what are different groups doing? Um, you know, Generation Citizen is engaging in action civics. We'll talk about what that is. We're doing some advocacy and policy work, but we want to really build this field. Um, no one group alone can, can solve all the challenges that, that we're engaging in. Um, and so it's important to, to, to really talk as a field about, about how to do that. But I think What's really important that we're thinking about is is focusing on the foundations of our democracy, uh, and I think all the groups on this call agree with addressing some of the challenges that that Kay was talking about. Um, the fact that youth participation is down, that midterm number, I think, is incredibly important. Um, beyond just what happened in this in this 2016 election, the fact that 20 percent of young people voted in um, in, in in previous elections um, in, in in 2014, but but how do we really get uh, at, at the at the root cause of what's happening there, and so we'll start to talk about this. As Kristen said, you know, we're we're so gratified by all the response that we've gotten. This needs to be just the start of the conversation, and we're going to get into this stuff just piecemeal. Uh, and hopefully, there'll be a, the opportunity to have specific conversation or webinars to go in in more detail to some of the the challenges that we're that we're seeing afterwards as well. So next slide. Um, Generation Citizen is, is, a, is an organization that, that focuses on action civics, and, and Brian Brady from MICPA Challenge is going to talk a little bit more about action civics later. But I did want to point out um, the specific framework that we think is really important. We call it the Advocacy Hourglass. Um, and this is, we work in, in six states throughout the country with over 10,000 students, and they all use this approach, um, which is they, they focus on big community issues, then they, 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 they target a, a focus issue, they figure out the root cause of that issue, and then they figure out a specific goals, targets, and tactics to, to deal with that. We just released a report yesterday, we sent it to many of you, that talks about why civic learning and action civics is more important now than ever before, and it really uses this action, this, this action civics advocacy hourglass 
to go through that. And I think it's a, an interesting way to think about youth civics learning, period. Youth civics learning is not going to uh, address all of the problems in our democracy. Um, but I think that, 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 that thinking about the fact that we're not preparing young people to be informed and active citizens writ large is an important root cause and a goal of ensuring that we can get all young people to become informed and active citizens uh, is necessary, is a necessary component um, to the long-term challenges that we, um, you know, that, 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 that we see. Um, so, so next slide. In addition to this paper, um, we put together a specific infographic. So a lot of this um, is, is along the lines of the advocacy hourglass, and some of this is, is work that, 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 that Kay talked about before. Um, but this is really to, to demonstrate, you know, this slide shows all of the challenges that, that we face with voter turnout being low, the fact that we live in ideological bubbles. Um, I think on the bottom right, it's important to, sh to, 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 to uh, acknowledge that young people are not apathetic. I think that that's a trope that, um, that, that receives attention and should not. Um, it's just that young people do not see politics as a way to affect change. Um, again, in a, in a nonpartisan way, you're seeing with the ramifications of this election just this week that, that politics has, uh, has repercussions. And so um, we need to teach young people that politics matters and that, and that affecting political change is a way to, to, to make positive change in society in addition to, to volunteering as it demonstrates. Um, this, this infographic is available on our website and we sent it around yesterday as well. Next slide. Um, and, and so, as I said, again, going through the hourglass, um, you know, civics on the aggregate, you know, even when we say the word civics, a lot of times people think of three branches of government, how, here's how a bill becomes a law. Um, you know, there's too much focus on, on the rote facts. Um, and um, there's a stark civic education gap as well. Um, so if you go to a school with more resources, you're going to get more civic experiences. And this lends itself to a, a bigger um, civic engagement gap as well. Um, and so those are all challenges that, that, that we need to address as we, as we move forward. Next slide. So on this webinar, we're going to go through, as I said, a number of different solutions. And I think the challenge that we have to figure out as a field is how do we balance content with action? And I'm seeing some of the questions start to roll in on, you know, news literacy and, and figuring out how people actually understand the process. Some really thoughtful questions so far. And I think the challenge is it's not enough just to teach young people how government works. And it's also probably not enough to teach them just how to act. And so the, the challenge that we have as a field is, is how do you do both at the same time? Um, there's three different components that we're going to focus on in this webinar. The first uh, is action civics education. And, and Brian Brady from the MICWA Challenge is going to talk about that. That's what Generation Citizen does. Just as you learn science through doing science experiments, uh, you, you, you learn STEM through engaging in robotics. Uh, action civics thinks that you learn civics best through actually engaging in civics and taking action on real world issues. Um, so that's a specific sort of newer civic education approach um, where we think there's a lot of energy. We're going to talk through some specific policy solutions as well. It's not enough just to fund programs. Um, there's some work being done that Generation Citizen's been engaged to uh, to lower the voting age to 16 in local elections. That just happened in San Francisco. And some work being done uh, by, by some prominent folks in the field to get more young people registered, voting, caring about the civic process. Um, and, and we're also going to have Sean Healy from the McCormick Foundation talk about um, some really great work they did in getting civic legislation passed in Illinois. Uh, there's a lot of states that are interested in this work. And we want to talk about how funders can support the policy space as well. Uh, we're also going to talk about youth organizing. Um, so a lot of this stuff that, that I just talked about, action civics, can be sometimes more in the classroom. Um, there's a lot of folks that are engaging in really interesting, exciting work with young people engaging in politics outside of the classroom on specific advocacy issues. That work is really important right now. I think sometimes civic learning and, and youth organizing are seen um, as two disparate takes. We really feel like they're one and the same in terms of getting to this, this ultimate goal. Um, we're gonna have some young people on this call. It's really important to us that, that young people are front and center. Um, and so they're gonna be, they're gonna be talking as well and you'll get to, you'll get to hear from them. Um, but again, as, as I sort of sign off here, um, we're just, we're, we're really gratified that there's more interest in the space. There's, there's a lot of hard questions that have to be grappled with and I'm, I'm seeing them, you know, start to, start to come in. Um, but, 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 but I think that, you know, the fact that there is interest here, I'm hopeful that we as a field, organizations, uh, folks that are focused on program, folks that are focused on policy, uh, can really start to work together to figure out how we, how we start to, to, to build 
uh, the field up as well. So I'm going to turn it over. I think Kristen's going to um, Kristen's going to kind of introduce Brian to, to to get us into uh, into the next part of it. Great. Thanks so much, Scott and Kay. And I do want to introduce Brian, but um, because I'm monitoring the chat, I want to have a little throw a little bit of a curveball into it just for a quick like 30 seconds. Um, a couple of questions have come in about to Kay around your point around news literacy and that it can't and can't and probably shouldn't just be about um, educating for news literacy, but creating an appetite for consumption of media broadly. And so, Kay, I'd just love to um, ask you for maybe just a couple of seconds. Do you have ideas about how we can um, not only not only support news and information literacy among young people, but also help them understand the diverse media landscape and the um, consumption and why, why and how they should consume information, especially as the field is shifting so much around that. Great. Thanks. I hope you can hear me now. Thanks for the question. And it's so true that it's, you know, there's been lack of demand, so to say. And, but part of it really is coming from the review of the landscape in news literacy. My colleagues, Peter Levine and Abby Kiza did, that give us some insight into that. One of it was that youth have to be on the production side, too, as well as consumer side. The advance in the technology has actually opened up a huge amount of potential in letting young people use media as a place to express their voice and opinions in a way that's really informed and really thoughtful. And especially especially for youth of color who's been really active in social media and using social media as a place where they can develop their voice and also gather you know, enough uh, buy-in for their voices. It's been really powerful. But the communication between the media ecosystem and young people has to be more two-way than it is now. That's part of the finding that they've seen. And I think education can actually change that a lot. But so participate in incorporating young people's voices and consumers' voices in general a little bit more to really think about how to work with the new producers of media as opposed to trying to really shut them down as destruction to the mainstream media. Thanks so much, Kay. And Um, we service students ages 16 to 21. Um, many of them have been let go from their old schools um, due to behavior or they've been incarcerated and as part of their probation, they have to um, come back to school and finish out or, or you know, maybe even um, some of the girls have become young mothers and now um, it was probably hard for them to integrate back into their old schools and they joined us um, a second chance. <laughs> Thanks, Stormy. And my, you know, just a heads up, my screen went blank, so I'm going to fly a little blind here, but I'm going to my actual PowerPoint. So next slide should be a photo of some students doing the, some action civics design thinking work around the problem of youth employment. Um, and the next screen, um, I'm hoping you guys are on, is uh, why action civics. And I'm not going to take long on this because Scott delved into it really well. Um, I want to bullet two, you know, I've been in this line of work for almost 20 years, and I think why I love it so much and, and see the power of it is civic agency. And to me, that's about power and what happens when young people suddenly realize that they have power to uh, transform their own lives, their own schools, their own communities, and their cities and country. Uh, um, it, it's an awakening process that's pretty amazing to see happen. So I want to put Stormy on the spot to talk. Stormy was both a student and a teacher now, and just growing up in North Lawndale in Chicago, how did that process happen for you? So growing up in North Lawndale, which is a very disadvantaged um, community, I often felt extreme um, hopelessness. Like, you know, just looking at, you know, everything that was going around um, in my community, I didn't feel like I could change anything until I was introduced to MICFA and um, Action Civics. When I was introduced to Action Civics, I started to look at the issues um, happening in my community, and I, I felt like, you know, 
I could change. I can I can make change, like real change, you know, happen in my community. And I also start to feel a sense of ownership. Um, no longer was it not my problem, but, you know, it was like, you know, I could actually change things. Even in my own school, I started a comprehensive sex education program um, called Think, which is Things Happen If No Knowledge. And, you know, just starting that program, um, I remember we had a, a guest speaker come, and the speaker, she said, ignorance is a disease that if not treated, you can die from it. And one thing, you know, I learned from that along with Action Civics is, you know, part of being a citizen is you have to always be informed. Um, and so I make sure that I'm always up, you know, on um, what's going on in the world, what's going on in my communities. And this is something that I also, you know, try to instill in my students as well, like the importance of being informed. Thanks, Stormy. We'll go to the next slide here, uh, which should be, I'm hoping everybody's on. It's just young people losing faith in government. And both Kay and Scott talked about this, um, but you know, if you looked at the statistics on young people of color, they mostly encounter in government life, low-income young people, teachers and police are, are the government entities and paid staff uh, that they mostly uh, deal with, Stormy, and, and both both school and teachers and police, I don't want to put them in the same category, but you can get a sense of disempowerment from them. You want to talk a little bit on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, for example, at my own school, um, well, the statistic 66% of African American youth have little or no confidence in the police. Um, I have students who worked on a campaign where they actually tried to um, mend the broken relationships between the youth and the police. Um, and when I tell you this was one of the hardest things I think my students ever did, um, but it was something that needed to be done. Um, many of them, because they've had very negative um, and like very negative interactions, um, they were not, they were not accepting of like, you know, having to play basketball with the officers. Um, but it was shocking to see after the game was over, even after my students lost, that their mindsets were changed. And, you know, somehow they started to see like, okay, well, not all police officers are bad. And yeah, there are some bad apples, you know, in the bunch, but not all. And um, even then they, you know, wanted to get some dialogue going with these officers. Um, so I can definitely attest to that statistic. And Nick has been asked by the mayor of Chicago to put together a youth police council. So Stormy students will now they're starting to build a bridge of the relationship gap. They're not going to help design what a youth police council would do in Chicago and how young people could provide direct, honest feedback on policy changes and also training for, for police officers in Chicago, which, as you guys know, is a huge issue here. Um, next slide, we should have be on what is Action Civics. Um, action Civics is a new field that really has borrowed heavily from youth organizing and also social justice service learning. Um, and it takes a lot of the elements of youth organizing and brings it into the classroom and the school environment, both in school and out of school. Um, it centers around youth voice and choice. We don't believe teachers should pick the issue um, or organizations. Um, it starts with an asset-based analysis. So young people, no matter where they grow up, they look at the assets in their community before they start tackling some of the challenges. Um, it believes youth can be researchers, that, that, that they have expertise that young people can interview each other and draw on each other's expertise. Um, it believes in young people taking concrete action in the policy arena and the advocacy arena and to elect public officials um, who they want can represent their views. Um, next slide here shows uh, some young people door knocking and MICFA started as an electoral based program. We get a couple thousand students uh, knocking, uh, being election judges, campaigning for candidates of their choice, uh, holding candidate forums, holding marches to the polls, registering voter, voter education guides. And Stormy, you were telling me you, you worked for a certain person in high school in 2004. Yes, so um, I had the pleasure of campaigning for President, well, former President Barack Obama um, when he was at the time state senator. So I worked on his campaign to become a U.S. senator. And um, it's funny because in his final speech, I remember him saying, some of you guys have been with me since 2004. And like with the biggest smile, I'm thinking I was, I, I was that person he was talking to. Like I've been with him um, campaigning and, you know, um, since 2004. So I was a part of history um, because of action civics. And I think door knocking, you know, these simple actions of door knocking and talking to strangers, we talk about talking across difference, um, are really fundamentals of democracy is talking 
uh, across with people you don't know about politics. And that's a key part of action civics is getting you out of your comfort zone, interacting with different people, interacting across communities. Um, we'll take young people to New Hampshire, almost all young people of color to, to participate in the caucus and they're talking to 99% white uh, voters. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing cross-cultural experience for both sides. Uh, and a great learning experience too um, for, for both the young people and the voters they talk to. Um, the next slide has to do with MICFA's framework for action civics. We have a robust elections program. We have youth policy councils. They've had a, a bunch of good wins lately on, on getting free transit for young people to go to school on a big campaign for a culture Chicago wears condoms to reduce the STI rate on redesigning the criminal the juvenile justice courtrooms in Chicago and uh, creating an expungement app for young people to get connected to low income to pro bono attorneys. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is, as you can see, the six step process for our issues to action program mirrors a lot of community organizing and Scott's process. Um, again, it's taking those core principles building them into lesson plans that have uh, academic goals and social emotional goals, but also have the civic action embedded all through it. If you go to the next slide, why does action civics work? Um, because it has, a, you know, to me, it, it's strong pedagogy of student-centered learning, project-centered learning on real world issues. Uh, a lot of school is boring for young people and feels disconnected from their real life. Uh, action civics directly connects young people so there's not this cognitive dissonance between school and the community. Um, addresses root problems, it's centered around youth voice and respect. It's centered on teacher respect and making teachers' lives better too. And it's fun and it has immediate impacts. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about your students? We've got about two minutes to go here mm -hmm. and, and how they've responded to uh, some of this action civics work. So um, I think I mentioned earlier about the, the guys who um, worked on the project to, you know, mend relationships between police officers and um, youth in inner city communities. Um, another campaign that um, happened at my school was some students actually um, started, well, they, they built a library. So we don't have a library, and one of the issues my students often um, face is, like, they feel like we're not a real school because we don't, you know, have some of the activities that a lot of traditional schools have. Um, so one of our avid readers, she said, you know, this is not cool. Like, why don't we have a library or a place to go study? And um, I say, you're right. You know, if you want a library, you guys have to, you, you have to do it. Like, you have to speak up. And they did just that. They went to administration. Um, they were vocal about what they wanted. They applied for a grant um, in which they were awarded, you know, $1,000, and they built them a library. And, you know, when I tell you, like, the students are using the library, and they've even found a way um, to use some of the books to communicate with individuals that are incarcerated. Um, and so one of our students, um, he recently, you know, went to jail and he asked if he could borrow um, a book. And they said, yeah, if you can write a book report and send it back to let us know the connections you can make. So those are just some of the things they're doing at my school. That's amazing, yeah. And I think, I, I love that Action Civics works to me really effectively with young know, people who are traditionally disempowered. Mm -hmm. and it gives them this a direct answer, a way to take action and get mm -hmm. power. Um, last couple of slides here, we go through kind of quickly. Uh, make sure, the next slide is make the action civics impacts. If you see, look at this, 87% uh, are believing they can make a difference. They're voting at seven times the rate. They're volunteering on campaigns at 16 times the rate. Um, and improve reporting of teamwork, communication skills, and all those is areas of, of being an effective citizen. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, you just see young people. We do special events with young people to showcase their voice and work. And lastly, you know, why I invest in action civics? I think it has scalability. It takes the principles of youth organizing and uses teachers as community organizers um, and trains them to do that. Uh, it builds capacity in of schools and communities. Um, it builds on assets that we already have, especially the young people, um, and is nonpartisan, can fit into various educational paths. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds, you get to finish Stormy. What's the impact you've seen on you and your friends that you grew up with? Well, I'll definitely say that um, most of my friends, we are in service, you know, um, position, well, we're in service, um, well, we're professional, well, we're in, um, we are in jobs of service, right? Yeah. So I have a lot of um, friends who are teachers and, you know, some are lawyers and some even 
work for Mikva. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, we all, you know, we're working with youth because we understand the positive impacts that, you know, um, organizations like Mikva has had on our in our lives. And so, you know, we're all paying it forward um, in that sense. And, you know, we understand that action civics, it's actually, um, it's a pathway to feeling this sense of um, power, um, power that could change the world. And so, Thanks, uh, thanks, you guys. I, I hope you could follow along on the slides here because I was going uh, solo. But I want to pass it to my good friend and amazing educator himself, Sean Healy, who has changed Illinois civic education landscape. Take it away, Sean. Hi guys, sorry, I think we're having uh, some technical difficulties with Sean's audio, I really apologize. But while we try to troubleshoot that, let's go ahead and kick it over to another PACE member, um, Ian Simmons from the Foundation for Civic Leadership. Um, and then we'll try to get back to Sean. Also, just a quick reminder, we have a couple of little presentations and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Mm -hmm. We're all prepared to stay on until quarter past the hour if you guys can stay with us to make sure we have plenty of time for discussion. So, Ian, can you hear us? Is your microphone unmuted? No, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks so much, Ian. Great. Well, thanks. Um, I was asked to speak a little bit about policy. I know Sean was going to talk about uh, legisl state legislative policy action, and I wanted to talk about uh, changing uh, local policy as well as institutional policy. In order for best practices like Mikva Challenge and others to be created pervasively and sustainably um, uh, and over the long haul, uh, we need you know permanent rule changes to, to motivate um, school districts and institutions to to educate young people as citizens um, and one of those key innovations we think for the future is actually uh, lowering the voting age to 16 in local elections um, and a key reason for that is that uh, uh, 16 is a much better time to establish the habit of voting and when you overlap the voting age with attending high school uh, you end up with motivating teachers and school communities to focus on civic education so it's a way of, of really leveraging resources across the board. That policy solution can really leverage civics resources um, and the resources of schools to focus on 16-year-olds. Uh, many people don't know much about 16-year-old voting, so I did want to take a couple minutes to talk about why at Foundation for Civic Leadership we think this is a, not an, a, an immediate, um, you know, this isn't going to change the world tomorrow, but over the next 20 years is a terrific priority and exactly the right time for for um, funders and others to, to take it more seriously. One is that it's already happening. So there is a, um, already more than 12 countries already allow 16 year olds to vote. Um, and so millions of 16 year olds already do vote around the world. Uh, in the United States, there's already two cities in Maryland that have 16 year old voting. And uh, you know, just this year, um, there were two very significant ballot measures that, that helped advance this. Um, so, um, uh, a key part of the exciting work of 16-year-old voting is also many, many cases teenagers really are key partners in driving it. So this is an example of action civics in action um, where young people work together to, to create change. Um, what we help do at, at Foundation Civic Leadership is partner with groups like Generation Citizen and others just to kind of do survey the field. So create a white paper with legal research about which states have which rules and can allow which municipalities to lower the voting age to 16 and empower 16 year olds, include 16 year olds in, in local elections. Um, there's a you know, website uh, that already is, next slide please. There's a, a website um, called Vote 16 USA um, that we've set up to help uh, establish best practices in partnership with Generation Citizen and others and created a national youth advisory board of young people already involved in making this happen. There were some terrific media hits and articles over this course this year. I really recommend the article in Vox Dot com, um, as well as uh, looking at some of the video of young people who advocated in San Francisco and other places um, to make this happen. The Vox article really covered a lot of the issues and questions that many people have about 16-year-old voting. Um, the, in 2016, there were two really interesting campaigns. In San Francisco, young people put on the ballot a measure to allow them to vote in local elections. And we were expecting, honestly, to, to finish about 30% of the vote. And it ended up close, close, coming at 48% uh, and nearly winning. Uh, on the first try at a ballot initiative, which is unprecedented for new ballot issue areas and is really promising for the future of, of this work. And in Berkeley, uh, the ballot measure actually passed with over 70%. Um, 
the in terms of the key future for this area, next slide please, is you know, supporting emerging campaigns where young people are driving change and working with interested legislators in multiple states to help also make it easier for municipalities to pass state issue, state uh, to pass to pass 16 year old voting. In some cases, states actually prevent cities from um, self governance, uh, including uh, adjusting the voting age to to better reflect the electorate. Um, over the next several cycles, uh, winning more ballot measures and encouraging more city councils to pass this would. Uh, help provide more examples of best practice and bring the policy idea further into the mainstream. Um, and this idea, again, keeps youth voice at the center. I do encourage you to watch some of the, the videos online with the students who are pushing for the San Francisco ballot initiative. Um, they're uh, extremely capable of making their own case um, about why their voice should be included. Um, so starting 16 is something that also experts like Peter Levine at Circle and others have advocated for that just starting earlier than 18 is a much better time. People are living in their communities they're from, they understand the issues that they're voting on, um, and they haven't yet moved away from uh, home and be, be in a dislocated situation, which is what happens when uh, most young people turn 18. They're usually uh, living outside their home and living away, away from home. Um, um, the some of the initial main main concerns with this have to do with like are 16 year olds capable of, of voting and what's their sophistication level and in fact there's really interesting psychological research showing that 16 year olds are extremely capable uh, at, at voting voting decisions around some other impulse oriented decisions that's more seen as like hot thinking they do have they aren't quite as evolved as like 18 or 21 year olds but on these sort of cold more more deliberative decisions they're actually uh, really at a high level of equivalence um, and in fact, when young people have been surveyed about their knowledge levels, um, when they have the right to vote, they often have, they show very equivalent levels of knowledge. So again, this is a kind of innovation that, you know, if we start now within 10 or 20 years, this could really be pervasive across the country and have huge positive knock-on effects and become one of the most efficient ways of motivating school districts to do civics. Um, the, uh, the second set of innovations I want to talk about have to do with institutional changes in higher education. Um, today, over about half the US population goes through higher education one point or another, including uh, college and community college. Um, and FCL started a study five years ago to measure uh, student voting rates at institutions and allow any campus in the country to measure their voting rate. Over 900 campuses now do this. And um, the team, uh, which is now based at Tufts, uh, and the NSOLV team at the Institute of Democracy of Higher Education, um, has collected a massive data set allowing a much deeper understanding of best practices than even we had two years ago. Um, this is a really interesting good news story in terms of institutional policy. Uh, what we think we're learning is that there are institutions that have voting rates of you know, upwards of 60 and 70 percent. Um, the a typical voting rate for a, a presidential election for college students is about 45 percent and the lows in the 20s, but there, there are these schools that have voting to 60, 70 percent. What's interesting there is that um, the team at NSELF has already sent teams to some of these campuses. And they're discovering this basically what, what could be sort of the holy grail is replicable and scalable practices <laughs> that aren't very expensive that schools are doing. They really intersect with civic learning. Um, an example practice of this is one which I love is one of the high outlier campuses actually um, uses their freshman writing class. And a lot of four-year schools have a required freshman writing class. And they have the freshman writing class on day one register students to vote in small groups. And then the rest of the writing class for the whole semester focuses on public policy relevant to students. So this, whether you're an engineer or a, a biologist or a poet or a political scientist, you know, whatever your, your intended major, you actually spend the first semester of college writing about public policy relevant to students. So you get a, a more in-depth civic, civic education, even whether you had it at high school or whether you intend to do it in college as a specialty. Um, and it's a brilliant use of the college uh, experience because this is a free intervention. If you already have a freshman writing class, you don't have to hire new instructors. You just can just orient your own public policy. So um, the, uh, if you could flip to the next page. So you know, this is an example report that schools get. Uh, and this is actually Stanford's report. Um, currently, one of the challenges is, is even though you have 900 schools sign up for the, the study, um, and more schools can, can sign up, any school that can sign up any day, you know, most schools don't publicly discuss, haven't publicly announced their data. The Stanford has, and this is what their results. Um, and once a school has sort of publicly discussed their data with their students, they can more easily set an intention to improve it. So where the institutional chip policy 
uh, angle sets in is that, again, we've discovered, we think that institutional commitment to this matters uh, tremendously. And therefore also partners commitment to those institutions matter. So for example, on the funder perspective, you know, we're starting to ask every university we give a grant to, to actually submit their NSOL report to us and uh, to publish their report. Um, and this is something that funders can do and create, have, have non-financial commitments to expanding civic literacy, civic engagement, civic education by starting to, to use their relationships to demand higher levels of accountability and engagement. Just like you know, foundations um, are acquiring more diversity reports of, of boards of directors of grantees, you know, asking for you know universities' commitment to civic engagement, um, where they stand and what's their plan to improve, is a non-financial action which can help reflect you know, our our commitment to the culture of improving uh, civic engagement in higher ed. The short version here, if you go back the slide for one second, is the the average, if we can take those medians um, for the midterms is 20 and for the presidential is 45, and really over the next 10 years, drive them up to become high outliers in the 60s and 70s, and even drive those high outliers up even further. It really represents a terrific opportunity. <clears throat> we already know best practices exist, and scaling them requires you know, motivating institutional partners to um, create plans of action. So this is kind of an example of institutional policy change that is replicable and scalable, and whether further research and, and action is needed. But the time is, is really, really right from, from our perspective, we think, to help drive change around the country. Um, a final great feature of this is that local action matters. So if you have a, a local commitment in a certain geography, um, whether it's Boston or Ohio or <clears throat> California, you can dive in with people in your community right now and sort of ask where do things stand, whether in terms of 16-year-old voting or in terms of college uh, engagement and start to make a real difference in your community now. So um, uh, I'm happy to ask some more, answer more questions about this later, but I just wanted to brief a little bit why we were um, uh, so interested in these spaces and pointing out there's really new opportunities given the data and given teenage interest in making change to, to drive long-term change and high leverage sustainable ways where we're really taking advantage of institutions, in this case high schools and colleges, to uh, really accelerate, accelerate practice in civic learning. Um, I'd like to send back to Oliver now. All right, thank you very much. Um, my name is Oliver Sungui York. I am a senior in high school in San Francisco, and I was one of the two students who started um, the Vote 16 campaign in San Francisco in 2014. And uh, so, you know, I just want to give you a little sense of really what an amazing opportunity it has been for the um, core group of 30-some youth leaders in San Francisco um, to be engaged in the campaign. Um, I would say that on many days, I actually ask myself if there is anything I know um, <coughs> that didn't come from Vote16. Uh, as a student engaged in the campaign, it was the perfect blend of workplace skills and public speaking, um, and political engagement, <coughs> and excuse me, I have a small cough that I'm working through right here. Um, but the most remarkable thing was watching the effect that the campaign had on students who are not in our core team. I have never come across an issue that so many students were passionate about. <coughs> I uh, gave a presentation at my small high school, about 100 students in our grade, um, about Vote 16 at the beginning of the year. And throughout the rest of the week, I had literally dozens of students coming up to me asking about how they could be involved. Um, if you look throughout the course of our campaign, we had hundreds and hundreds of students turning out to our public hearings. Um, <coughs> and our ballot measure actually had the biggest mobilization of volunteers of any campaign in San Francisco. Excuse me. <coughs> um, most excitingly, though, um, Vote 16 was a stepping stone for students across the city to become more politically engaged in other issues. So conversations started about Vote 16 and then turned into conversations about talking about other ballot measures and issues <coughs> in the city. Um, another great thing has been watching the support that we've been getting from both political leaders and educators. So in San Francisco, we got the endorsement of um, Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi and the San Francisco Democratic Party. Um, but we recognize that the idea of engaging young people is fundamentally nonpartisan. And because we are looking most specifically at um, local engagement 
um, it is actually also not as radical um, as people think, even though it has the opportunity to close a gap um, that can be as much as 10 to 20 years in um, voter turnout. Um, one side note that I want to bring up um, that I'm always really curious about, and I look forward to seeing more data from Berkeley, is the potential for uh, Vote 16 to actually increase voter turnout among parents um, because their students are more engaged. <coughs> um, and so it has really been, as I was saying, a kind of a uh, gateway or a stepping stone for students to go on to other issues. Um, in our core team, many of us have gone on to pursue other interests. So for example, um, I've now taken a position on the uh, board of the National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Northern California. I have friends who are working on um, <coughs> uh, reform of police relations in the city and reform on housing solutions and finding solutions for our homeless community in San Francisco. Because really what this campaign has given us is the idea that um, even if we don't go into politics, seeing how far the campaign went has left us with this conviction that government and public policy can be affected by the public, that it will be affected by the public, and that we young people can actually be the agents of change. Um, and that is really hope. And that's the message that I hope we can bring to people across the country. Um, I would be happy to um, take some questions if I am able to still be around during the Q&A, but thank you. Thank you so much, Ian and Oliver, and thank you guys for your patience with um, Sean's audio. Uh, always a blessing and a curse to work with technology. So um, one of the challenges I think in, in a lot of this work is balancing some of the program and service delivery mechanisms with some of the policy or systems level work that then makes these opportunities more ubiquitous, which is something I know the McCormick Foundation has worked a lot on. So Sean, if we have you now, I would love for you to jump in and share a little bit about that. So can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. All right. Wonderful, all right. Well, sorry everybody about the, the technical uh, flaw. Uh, so excited to, to be with you today and, and thanks to all the folks that have stayed on for this, this entire uh, webinar. And uh, was asked to talk a little bit about uh, the work we did in Illinois to, to, as what we said, bring civics back. And that's a debatable term, of course, uh, but wanna talk a little bit about how we made the case uh, from a policy perspective the specific policy that we moved, and then some of our early efforts to support implementation, which in, in my mind is really everything. Policy is an opportunity. Uh, the end is pursued through implementation. So uh, if we could proceed to the next slide, uh, and start by, by how we made the case, and we've been uh, grateful for a partnership we've had for uh, a number of years with the National Conference on Citizenship, and they of course work with Circle uh, to produce information on civic health, uh, one of our partnerships produced an infographic uh, that overlaid civic health amongst Illinois millennials vis-a-vis -vis their counterparts in 49 other states and the District of Columbia. And I'm not going to go through point by point on this infographic. On lots of measures, our millennials looked a lot like other parts in the country, but there were a couple of things that really stood out. One, our voting in local elections was really low. We were 47th in the country on that. And then on lots of measures of social capital, so talking to neighbors, exchanging favors with them, working with, with them to uh, resolve problems in the community, we were bottom 10. So we used that data and some others to help make our case and basically say, uh, we're, not, we're really not preparing the next generation of participants in our democracy in Illinois to be effective participants. And if you follow the news, you know we're, we're a laugh line on late night uh, TV shows in terms of uh, the state of our state. So uh, it's kind of grim and we, we really need to look to the next generation uh, to improve things. If you could proceed to the next slide, please. Uh, then as we looked at uh, kind of a long-term solution uh, with civic education in mind, uh, Illinois had one, one of the lowest credit requirements uh, to graduate uh, in social studies in high school in the country. Uh, so most states uh, require three uh, most uh, in that third requirement get to a civics or government class 
as of a couple of years ago, we didn't have that. Could proceed to the next slide, please. And so, of course, every state says something about civic education. Uh, I would argue our previous uh, laws, our, our school code, uh, provided little more than window dressing uh, with respect to civics. So, did say we had to talk about the founding documents, we had to teach about uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, yes, the Australian ballot and methods of voting. Uh, to a lot of teachers' surprise, we're supposed to teach about the flag code and, of course, the mandatory recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. And that uh, combined effectively constituted civic education in Illinois up until a couple of years ago. Next slide, please. So uh, long story short, uh, as part of some policy efforts uh, we were part of under the auspices of a statewide coalition called the Illinois Civic Mission Coalition, of which uh, the Mikva Challenge and Brian Brady are important members. Uh, we advocated for the creation of a state task force on civic education uh, that ultimately was created by the legislature. And one asked to just give us a lay of the land. What does civic education look like in Illinois? I just did that for you. Uh, two, what's happening in other states and other jurisdictions? And three, what is best practice? And then ultimately to make some policy and funding recommendations. So you see those uh, on the screen uh, in front of you, and, and we purposely, uh, number one, said we think we should require civics like other states do, and we are also pretty prescriptive, so turning to the next slide, pretty prescriptive on not just teaching civics, uh, but to getting to what Brian and, and Scott were talking about in terms of action civics. Sure, making sure we have that traditional focus on government institutions, but then having these more student-centered or action-oriented practices like students engaged in current and controversial issues discussions, service learning, simulations of democratic processes. Uh, so uh, in 2015, uh, we moved uh, a bill through both houses of the legislature. Uh, we're able to earn strong bipartisan support. Uh, Illinois is a really interesting state in the current uh, context in that uh, at least at this time, we had Democratic supermajorities in the legislature, but then ultimately we needed the signature of a, a conservative Republican governor. So we knew we needed that bipartisan support. We got it, and we, we ultimately got his signature in August of that same year. Uh, that law took effect last summer. So what it means is freshmen that were coming into high school uh, this past fall, 2016-17 school year, will have had to have taken and com successfully completed a semester of civics with this prescribed content. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so we, we did a bit of a shot kind of on the front end, just what is the context? And I think it speaks to the need for state policy. Uh, so believe it or not, most schools in our state were already requiring that students uh, complete at least a semester of government. It was mostly government or civics prior to graduation. And then most of those that didn't have the requirement had some type of course offering. So it wasn't like there was no civics or government course content, uh, but there was a slice of schools where there was literally nothing under that umbrella of civics or that we couldn't uh, get information on. So certainly some equity issues, and if you could turn to the next slide, we map this uh, across our state, and uh, this is a map that basically divides us into educational regions, so six different regions. The individual data points aren't all that important, but you see as you go region by region, we have some regions like the upper northwest part of our state where 82% of schools were already requiring something. And then if you move to the Chicago area, our area much lower, less than half. And then here where I'm sitting in the city of Chicago, which is our largest school district in the state, one in five students in our state goes to Chicago public schools, no civic requirement or no civics requirement. So some major equity issues and going back to some of the points made earlier by Kay and, and Brian and Scott, uh, policy, I think, is therefore very critical as you try to scale this work and ensure equity across a big and diverse state uh, like Illinois. Moving to the next slide, please. Uh, we also want to drill down a little bit as we started doing the work and kind of pivoting towards implementation. Uh, we had data on what was being taught in terms of subject, uh, but didn't have a ton of an idea what that was happening in individual classrooms. Uh, we know from kind of existing research that didactic, teacher-led uh, discussion is pretty prevalent when it comes to teaching uh, civics or government. Uh, we know there are a lot of inequities as some of the earlier data points uh, demonstrated, but then just kind of statewide as we looked at these practices, 
We saw relative strength with respect to direct instruction, which one, once more we'd expect. Uh, and also with respect to discussion of current and controversial issues, we have some questions about how controversial, but nonetheless, uh, some strength there. A little bit less so when it came to simulations of democratic processes, and then a, a pretty big, gigantic trough uh, with respect to service learning. So certainly some needs out there as we turn towards supporting teachers in schools and districts uh, with course implementation and some variation by region in our state. If you turn to the next slide, please. So uh, in this data, I should say, comes from a statewide teacher survey that we did. So more than 700 teachers participated in our survey and the civics for government teachers. We drilled down a little bit uh, with respect to these practices, and I'm showing you a slide uh, related to data on service learning, but just try to get to how they kind of learn about these practices, whether they want to have formal training opportunities, see the second bar there, whether they have opportunities to learn from one another, uh, which thankfully many do in our state, uh, and then turning, going down the list, whether there are adequate financial resources to support uh, their professional development and whether their administration is supportive of this. Unfortunately, on three of these four measures, really a lack of support. So turning to, to my next slide, which is I believe my final slide, uh, our implementation model really ad attempted to address these needs. So one, you need funding. Our state is flat out broke. We actually haven't had a budget for a couple of years. So if implementation was gonna happen, uh, it had to come from private funding. So thankfully work at a place that cares a lot about this issue. We were able to rally a number of other uh, foundations and also corporations to help support our implementation efforts. We built institutional partnerships throughout our state. Uh, many of those partners are colleges or universities. Some are regional offices of education, and they serve as sites uh, for teacher professional development. Uh, they also have expertise in their own right, and of course have lots of relationships with local teachers and schools and districts. We have, we're thankful as I move to the bottom right quadrant, uh, thankful to have a, a really strong cohort, I would suggest the strongest in the country, uh, cohort of civic education nonprofits based right here in Chicago, MICFA Challenge, one of them, who are really proficient, not just at developing resources and student programs, but in training teachers and supporting them on their resources. So we wanted to, to uh, activate that group, but mobilize them throughout the state. And moving to my last quadrant, our teacher mentors, this was kind of the way that we were gonna do this. So very difficult to get all these Chicago organizations all over the state. How can we provide some intense training and support to teacher mentors who are literally situated in every part of our states? So we've recruited uh, 35 teacher mentors, given them intense training, and proceeded to provide uh, professional development workshops throughout our state uh, throughout the summer months, and then also sprinkled throughout the school year and have our mentors, mentors doing continuous outreach in their respective areas. Uh, we're starting to evaluate this work. Uh, Kay, if she's still on the call, her team at, at Circle uh, studying some of the impacts that we're having and early returns, particularly at the level of uh, teacher confidence, proficiency, uh, very strong. I have to say we're just uh, first year into this. It's a three-year plan to support implementation, uh, but we're really excited uh, about what's happened here and really eager to, to share what we've learned and, and hopefully some of our efforts are emulated in other states. I know just to, to give a quick shot of as I wrap up my remarks, we learned so much from what other states did. So Florida, for example, informed a lot of our efforts, uh, different context there, so we had to make it our own and make it work in Illinois. And uh, this is what we came up with. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, so much. And thank you all for hanging in through this call. As you can see, there's so much robust work happening in this field that um, we haven't had enough time to get to at all. So I do wanna say while um, we know that many of you have, have hung in for a while, if you chat questions to me, I will make sure and I will make a commitment to get responses to them that we will publish on the PACE Funders website so that we can continue the conversation. But I do want to appreciate um, my colleague Eric Braxton from the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing. And I want to go ahead and turn it over to him for the balance of our time, as long as folks can stay on, um, the balance of our time to Eric to talk about how some of this work in schools actually extends um, into community groups as well. So, uh, Eric? 
Hi, folks. Uh, great to be with you all today. I'm excited to be having the conversation about how youth organizing groups and action civic groups and others can work together to really create a robust field of youth engagement. Uh, I'll be brief because I know we're, we're running over time, um, uh, but want to just hit on a couple of, of key points. I think first off, if our goal is to ensure that young people remain active leaders in their communities, who are working together to solve real community problems for the long haul, the question is, what's the, predict the best predictor of that? And our research and experience shows that the best predictor of future civic engagement is actually engaging in real civic leadership now. And that the more young people play real leadership roles in guiding that work now, the more likely they are to continue that work for the long haul. And so youth organizing groups across the country are engaging young people from the most marginalized communities in projects that address root causes in their communities. Um, and by doing this, they're not only solving community problems, but they're also training the next generation of community leaders. Uh, so what, what is it that we mean by youth organizing? In the 1980s, the field of youth development grew, promoting the idea that you know, the best way to prevent risky behaviors by young people was to develop their skills and assets. Um, but by the 1990s, a, a new set of youth workers came together and said that not only do young people have skills and assets that can be developed, but young people have the power to collectively address these issues in their communities, and that doing this not only benefits the communities, but is one of the best ways to support the holistic development of those young people too. And so you know, over the last 25 years, the field of youth organizing has grown tremendously. Um, so again, what do, we, what, what do we mean by youth organizing? We're talking about groups that are community-based organizations that engage young people during out-of-school time, that engage mainly low-income young people and young people of color, those who've been most in, impacted by social inequity, uh, that young people themselves are primary decision makers and actors and leaders in the work, which again is one of the, 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 the key predictors when young people actually have experience leading the organizations, they're much more likely to continue that engagement beyond high school. That these groups uh, are not just protest organizations, but they're supporting young people in developing leadership, social and emotional skills, and academic skills. Um, and that at the same time, young people are, are engaging themselves in, in identifying issues, taking collective action, and really in, in, in shifting civic power in their communities. So the next slide, is, is a tool that we have often used uh, to understand the different approaches to youth engagement that exist. Um, so on the far left, you have youth service organizations that provide direct services to young people. And then we have youth leadership groups that engage young people uh, in having voices in their communities. There's youth civic engagement groups where young people identify issues and present solutions. Uh, and, and then we have youth organizing where young people not only identify issues, present solutions, but they build a membership base, form alliances, form coalitions, engage in collective action, and ensure that those solutions are, are carried out. The, the point of this continuum is that to meet the needs of all young people in a community, we need all of these kinds of organizations, but that we need to have strong relationships between the different kinds of organizations. And we're seeing more examples of where civic engagement organizations, leadership organizations, and youth organizing groups are collaborating and really building an inside-outside strategy. Uh, the next slide. The next point that I want to make is, is that you know, from a funding perspective, we see youth organizing as a two-for-one investment, that there are two levels of outcomes at the community level and at the individual level. At the community level, we have the, the victories that youth organizing groups are winning through their campaigns. One specific example that has really stood out to me in recent years is uh, that after generations of students of color not receiving courses that they needed to get to college, a number of youth organizing groups in California have gotten their districts to pass policies ensuring 
college courses are available to all students. So inner city struggle in Los Angeles passed a policy like this 10 years ago and has since been working to ensure that it's implemented. Now they can actually demonstrate that the college entrance rates in their neighborhood have grown significantly and that tens of thousands of students have now, uh, have now gotten admission to college and graduated from college based on their work. Uh, similarly, uh, school discipline uh, is, is an issue that youth organizing groups have been the forefront of addressing racial disparities in school discipline and creating a new paradigm based on restorative justice. And dozens of districts have now passed new discipline policies. On health, a lot of organizations have come together and organized for their schools to get healthier food for students. So these community level outcomes benefit whole communities and youth organizing groups over the last couple of years have been able to uh, significantly expand those outcomes. But again, youth organizing groups are not just having outcomes at the, at the community level. Participating in these campaigns also has tremendous benefits for individual young people. If we go to the, the next slide. So um, we see here some data from, uh, uh, from uh, Veronica Tariquez at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And this is comparing youth organ outcomes from youth organizing groups to uh, youth development and youth leadership groups in California. And you'll can, you can see that on a number of different outcomes uh, from uh, you know, the ability to solve community problems, uh, to public speaking, but then even uh, under uh, um, access to education and learning about college, that young people participating in youth organizing groups had higher outcomes. The, uh, the, if we go on to the next slide, we, we now have data that is longitudinal, that shows that young people who participate in youth organizing show outcomes years afterwards. So the Learning to Lead study that Veronica Tariquez and John Rogers did followed 2,600 youth organizing alumni in California. And they found that the alumni were far more likely than their peers from similar backgrounds to attend four-year colleges. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that that study also found that youth organizing alumni were far more likely to be civically engaged through volunteering or belonging to community organizations than similar peers, or even those who participated in student government. So we, we now really have the data to show that participating in youth organizing, that these young people are more likely to go to four-year colleges and far more likely to be civically engaged. Next slide. This is, just shows you an, a new tool that the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing has just launched, which is a searchable database of youth organizing groups across the country. It's just been launched and groups are just adding their data. But if you're interested in participating on this and looking at the data as it's coming in, you can go to fcyo.org slash maps. If you sign up for a profile, you can see examples of, of what some of these groups are doing across the country. And clearly the field of youth organizing has grown dramatically over the last 20 years. And in this moment, when many young people are feeling skeptical about the political process, youth organizing groups are giving young people real experiences to come together, to work for solutions to problems in their communities. And these real experiences of leading campaigns are the best predictor we have for future engagement. And lastly, I just want to say that as the country becomes a ma majority people of color, it's especially critical that we create structures that allow young people of color to participate in this democracy. And youth organizing groups have developed a set of practices that are especially relevant to support the real participation of those who've often been most marginalized in our communities. Thanks so much. Really looking forward to getting to continue to work with all the folks on this. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you to all of our speakers and all of you. Um, we, we ran over time, which is a great problem to have because there was so much robust information and programs and ideas to lift up. Um, for speakers who can stay, and it looks like we still have 43 people on the webinar, which is amazing. So if folks can stay and you want to um, chat in some questions,
questions or email questions, um, I will commit to getting answers from the participants and posting them to our website along with this video of the webinar today and some of the resources that have been shared. So that's just to say, please, um, please know that this is really just the beginning of our conversation. So with that, we did have one question that came in. And again, if folks have to jump off, that's fine. But one question that came in was really about how do we sure that this work stays nonpartisan? Um, I know Oliver mentioned that that was critically important. So I'd love to just hear from, the, from any participants who want to weigh in. How do we ensure that this work is nonpartisan, that it continues lifting up all sorts of approaches um, and issues in our community and stays on a very pragmatic level? Uh, this, this is Ian. Uh, just one brief thing is understanding, reminding people that this, is, this work is about encouraging Americans to participate in America, you know, and, and if people have an issue with that, they have their own issue with that. But taking a step back to understand this is what democracy is about is participating. in. So when, it, when it's framed that way, there's usually not much objection to it. Um, the other part is just making sure that their, you know, groups are properly vetted so that they aren't they understand the rules involved and they don't end up um, you know, violating any compliance issues and creating trouble down the line. So those would be the two main things, you know, having a positive message and just educating people on the rules. Hi, this is Brian from Mick. I would just say youth voice and choice. Um, the more you can anchor it inside of that, that language in the curriculum to be guided by youth community analysis. Um, it, that's the best way, but it does take some education and some some outreach to both sides of the aisle and third and fourth parties, et cetera. And I, this is Scott. I would just echo that focusing on local politics tends to make it as nonpartisan as possible too. So the, the local angle, I think, is is crucial in all of this. That's a great question. We had another question come in that says, uh, early on in the conversation, that says, how do we shift from a framework that we are going back to a time when democracy worked to an understanding that centers around racial and gender equity to allow us to invest in civic learning such that we can build the kind of democracy that we could be? So I guess that's, it's really saying, how do we take a more aspirational frame to this um, and not act like we need to go back to a, t a magical utopian time when democracy worked since it's always been um, a, an evolving process. How, how do we make it relevant today and not something that we should go back to? You know, this is Brian from McFa again. My, my two cents on that is, is we don't do enough dreaming and visioning with students um, and starting with, you know, what I, we used to have a contest called I Dream a City and having young people really dream, what, what would the ideal city look like for young people? Um, and using that as a forward visioning exercise, not a backwards, uh, although it's really important to also see how the current, uh, current state we live in is informed by you know, the, the many issues that people have had to deal with and still deal with today. So I think a combination of sort of forward visioning while still looking at structural problems. This is Kay Kawashima Ginsburg from Circle, and I agree with Brian, and I also think, you know, the, so much of the context surrounding learning has really shifted because of the policy changes and increase in political polarization in the great place we are in. So I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of really what is that that we're asking young people to equip themselves with in living in 21st century. I think what we thought was a good civics probably wouldn't be a good civics today. So I think we need to really ask that fundamental question, do a good job in doing the research, but also really understanding this different leverage point that people presented today, starting from policy to classroom practice to local engagement to youth organizing, opening up those pathways and making sure there's different pathways for diverse kinds of youth to become engaged in civic life as a whole, I think really has a promise in the future of civic learning field. much. Well, with that, I guess we will bring today's conversation to a close, but know that it's really just a start of 
what could obviously be many more in-depth and robust conversations about all types of work that are happening in the Cerdic learning space, um, and particularly how to set people up for success in their long-term civic life, both in school and out of school. So with that, I want to thank our presenters. I want to thank those of you who stayed on with us for 90 minutes. And again, just say this is, this is the beginning of a lot of conversations for that. So I know folks are sharing their email addresses in the chat box. Mine is Kristen at PaceFunders.org. And we would love to hear from you all about ideas that you have of ways that we can continue the conversation. We will put the video online. We'll put some of the resources, the infographics, and the links that you guys shared online as well. And we will circle back to the group. So thank you so much. Um, any other closing thoughts from the presenters? All right. Well, thank you guys so much and have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.